Um, it's a changing marketplace. That's what I'm going to talk about. For the first time in history, we have six generations that are living all under different ways that they want to receive products, receive messaging, their expectations, and all sorts of things. Because of that, it creates some unique challenges, and we'll talk about that. So I'm going to start off, though, with what is a market. A market is just a set of actual or potential customers. And oftentimes people want to slice and dice it and say, our market is this, our market is that. And the term gets abused. But at the end of the day, it's just a set of customers. And that customers could be defined however you want to define them. It really doesn't matter. But why it's important to understand who your customers are is because of this. So why did IBM end up losing the market, losing the computer market? Right? They were undoubtedly the largest player in the game. They owned hardware going back to the 1940s. Nowadays, they don't even make a IBM, you cannot buy an IBM computer anymore. They are a 100% consulting firm. And they missed out on it because they gave all the software rights to a 20-year-old named Bill Gates. And Bill, Microsoft ended up eclipsing IBM because they couldn't foresee it. They thought everybody's gonna buy hardware. They're gonna buy computers for the rest of their life. Nobody cares about the software on it. Bill Gates saw it the opposite. They didn't understand their market. Here's another one, Kodak. Kodak recently died. We talk about Kodak 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people would say, wow, that company's never going anywhere. And they died, people say, because they didn't have a digital camera, which isn't true. They actually had one in the 1970s. They created a, the first digital camera. They had it, they put it on the shelf in 1972 because they were terrified to eat their own lunch. They sold film. And if they rolled out this product, what did that do to their film business? Unfortunately, other companies weren't afraid of it. They rolled it out, killed Kodak. So before, because that's what happened. And then finally, Blockbuster. This is one of my favorites. Blockbuster, everybody remember going to Blockbuster or a video rental store? Netflix came along. They tried to sell themselves to Blockbuster three times. Literally, they walked in the door and said, we want to sell ourselves to you. You have all the money. You have all the inventory. You have all the, all of the, the overhead. We want to sell ourselves. Blockbuster said no. They couldn't see that uh, future where people didn't want to go to a store, pick up a movie, bring it home, have to bring it back, pay late fees. They missed out. Netflix brings everything into the home. And even Netflix has had to change, right? If you think about it, originally it was sending a CD or whatever it is to the mail. Now it's directly delivered. So understanding the market is important. If these companies can die or change or lose market share, IBM, Kodak, Blockbuster, then we surely have to pay attention no matter who we are to the marketplace. Ultimately what this all rests on is what we call is Theodore Levitt's jobs to be done theory. And what his theory states is that customers don't buy drills, they buy holes. At the end of the day, what we're selling is what the customer wants or what the customer needs. So in this case, they're not buying a drill, they're not drying a drill bit, they need a hole. So they're buying the hole. The drill and the drill bit are half the, the way that they get there. So it's important to understand what is it that we do. And here's a good example. If you ask Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, what he does, he'd say that they're a real estate company that sells hamburgers to pay the mortgage. So McDonald's is the, the second largest real estate holder in the world behind the church. And someday they're gonna cash in on all that. And Ray Kroc built the company, not to sell fast food, but to cover the mortgage. And someday, that's why when he sells the real estate, that's where he's gonna make his money. So we have to understand what business are we in. Here's another example, Wrigley's chewing gum. It was originally meant to sell baking powder, but the gum became more popular. They put it in to sell more baking powder and people said, hey, can we get the gum? Thankfully they listened. And they iterated, they stopped selling powder and started selling gum, and they're still around today. So it's important to understand what is it that our customers want. So on top of customer changing needs, the world's also speeding up. We expect new, we expect better, we demand more or less, and we demand now. And that's, that adds some additional complexity to markets. Some examples, it took 38 years for 50 million people to tune into the radio. It took 13 years for, people, or for 50 million people to go on the TV. Four years for people to go online. Anybody want to guess how long? 50 million people to take, adopt one of these? Two years. So if you watch that curve, 38, 13, 4, 2. It's a dot thing. Pardon me? Now, I couldn't even tell you now, right? At the, what's next? What's now? We don't know, but we know it's going to come fast and it's going to come furious. It used to be in the days of radio, if you captured an audience, you had them. 30, 25, 30 years where you had them. Now, not so much. The time it takes to adopt a whole new paradigm. So if you think of paradigms as scientific or you can think of paradigms in the market sense. 
social media was a new paradigm where we stopped talking to each other and now everything's online. My kids do this all the time, right? It's Facebook, this, Facebook. If it doesn't happen on Facebook, it's not real for them. So, you know, that's a paradigm adoption. That's going down by half every year. We're not talking about, hey, I'm changing my pants or I'm going to try my new hairdo. We're talking paradigm adoption. We're talking driverless cars. We're talking the first airplane. That's going down by half each decade. That's how fast we're moving. Anybody familiar with Moore's Law? So Moore was one of the founders of Intel, and he came up with a law that said every, roughly every two years, we will double the number of transistors on a computer chip and cut the cost in half. And that's really what's driven a lot of the speed. If we applied Moore's Law to airline industry, a $900 flight that took seven hours in 1978 to Paris from New York would now take less than a second and cost about a penny. That's how fast and how much we've improved. And that's what's driving a lot of this stuff. It took all human history to build a $7 trillion economy by 1950. Now we do that every decade, we basically double it. Uh, if you take all information that we had ever created, all mankind, any information, cave drawings, whatever it is, up to 2003, we double that every two days now. We double all information that we ever created all the way from the beginning of human history to 2003, every two days. That's how much data is out there. So the world's speeding up. And then finally, one of my favorites, a Boeing 747's wingspan is actually longer than the Wright Brothers first flight. That was only 100 years ago. So in the last 100 years, we went from no, fly, no heavier than air machines will ever fly to a wingspan that's longer than their first flight. In 100 years, we don't even think twice about it. So the world's speeding up. So what does this all mean? Speed leads to what we call the tyranny of choice. But if you don't believe me, go to the grocery store, especially if you have young children. I go there, we went to the cereal line the other day, we must have spent 15 minutes trying to figure out what cereal they want. I remember being young, it was Cheerios or Raisin Bran. That was about it. Now there's this, there's vanilla this, and chocolate that. It's the tyranny of choice. And the tyranny of choice causes us to be paralyzed. We can't make a choice because there's just too many around us. The average grocery store has 40,000 units in it. 40,000 different stocking units in the average grocery store. We can't comprehend how many different choices that is to make. So it leads to the tyranny of choice. In order to overcome that, we, what marketers, branders, sellers, entrepreneurs, however we want to define that, you got to differentiate yourself. you got to stand out. Because otherwise, people just have to put up blinders and we'd go insane. And the way we differentiate is what we is through branding. So what's brand? Brand is just a set of experiences around your product or service. And it's different than marketing. You can't brand until you have a, or market until you have a brand. A lot of people put it on one, one loop, but it is a completely different thing. So you gotta have a brand, then you can market. Then you can tell your story. First, you gotta have a story. So branding is important. Branding is your company's foundation. It's what creates the value, it's the promise you make. We can think about this in our everyday lives. There's a lot of companies that have fallen flat on those promises that they've made recently, and it's cost them dearly. You think of Target with the $350 million credit cards that got hacked. So that cost them a couple billion dollars in revenue. So they fell flat on their promise. They fell flat on their brand, and that's important. So it's a promise. At the end of the day, it's a promise. And if we follow through on our promise, customers believe us, they stay loyal, Business is good. If we, if we break it, they go away, we may not get them back, which we'll talk more about later. So what is branding? It's who you are, it's how you dress, and it's how you act in the world. And that last one's the most important. You think of companies like Nike, that's been a big one recently, right? Nike is all about winning. Nike is all about the best of the best until we found out that they're using child labor to, the, to make their sneakers somewhere overseas. And people revolted against them. And in fact, Adidas just overtook them as the fastest growing sneaker company for the first time in the last 50 years, just last quarter. So they've been hit, and they've been hit hard by the fact that they didn't act right in the world, and they got caught. So that last piece is important. A lot of companies overlook that, but we can't stress that enough. Branding is actually language at this point. It's estimated that about 1% of a two-year-old's nouns are brand names. 1% of a two-year-old's nouns are actually brand names. And to take it a step further, the most recognized symbol in the world right now is the Jordan Air brand or Air Jordan brand symbol. It's the most recognized symbol. They estimate 96% of the world, if you showed it to them, would know what it was. Mickey Mouse is second. So Air Jordan has overtaken Mickey Mouse. So as I joke with my classes, I'll say, you know, so if you find yourself in a strange world and you don't know the language and you don't know how to interact with people, show them the Air Jordan symbol, say okay, and say Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola.
principal is the most known word behind okay. And chances are you're on common footing. Once you're on common footing, who knows who goes? So branding literally is part of our language, but it's changing. So we had what we called the product era. So if you're a fan of Mad Men, that was the product era. You create a product, you push it on people, and you expect them to buy it. Then we went to the image area in the 80s and 90s, where it was all about image. The product didn't really matter so much. It was all about the image. It was different. It was better. It was slick. It was whatever. And now, finally, we're going to recall the positioning era. We'll talk about what that means. Some additional stats to show how important branding is. 85% of U.S. consumers say they would pay up to 25% more for a superior customer experience. It's doable. 25% more. That's a lot of margin. And 76% say that they appreciate it when brands and companies take a personal interest in it. And they make them feel like they're talking to them, not just to the whole world, not just that they're a company. So it's important, and it's backed up by data. So how do we do this positioning? We had some old rules of brand awareness. It was basically we make something for everyone, we tell our story, we track customers, and then we build brand awareness. And the famous quote from here is Henry Ford, where he said, my customers can have Model T in any color they want as long as it's because people wanted the Model T, they bought it because there was no other choice. But now with the tyranny of choice, think of cars. You can get anything you want. Almost anything you want. So customize it for it. So whereas Henry Ford was the old, now we have the new, which is you understand the customer's story. What is it that they want? Who are they? Where are they coming from? What do they look like? What food do they eat? What's the level of education? How many kids do they have? What's their family life like? You make something that they actually want, you give them a story to tell about it, and then finally, they create the brand for you. And they stay loyal to it, they feel like they own it. And the best, or most closest um, comparison is when we hear a song on the radio. A lot of people take pride in the fact, I heard that song first and before it became super popular. We have a brand affinity for that song. It's the same thing that's happening now with companies. And so when we find a brand, we have brand affinity if we find them. So what do we do is we brand your audience. And the audience now is online. So we have given up on the printed word. Uh, in fact, public rhetoric is designed to be comprehensible to a 10 year old child or an adult that has a sixth grade reading level. That's, what we're, that's where we're at. So image is overtaking words at this point. And it's proven by the data. Doesn't mean you have to go that way, but the data shows us it's all about image. And, and it's online. 74% of Americans do their shopping online. You not buy, but they're shopping online. Right now, we're in the midst of one of the most interesting wars we will ever see between Walmart and Amazon. Both of them are trying to completely own retail. And what's interesting is Walmart has the, the bigger brand name, Walmart has the stores, Walmart has employees. Amazon has Alexa. Amazon's in your home. And I knew in my mind Amazon was going to win the day my eight year olds came down and we were out of dish detergent. And they said, Alexa, put dish detergent on mommy's shopping. And she did. How do you compete with that? They're eight, they just created a shopping list. Just like that. So we don't know who's gonna win. It's gonna be interesting to watch out. Ultimately, I think it benefits all of us as, as consumers because they're gonna go to war anytime two companies go to war, that benefits us from pricing and different things, but it's online. And Walmart's now trying to do more things online to compete. And Amazon's trying to create stores to compete. And it's, it's just a very crazy time. So ultimately, all this leads to what we call a branding equation. So if you have looks plus features plus benefits plus perception, you have a brand. If you have product but don't have meaning, you have a commodity. And that's the worst place to be. The worst place to be is a commodity because you can be replaced tomorrow. We're in an international world. I guarantee they can make it cheaper, faster, better somewhere else. And if you don't believe that, it's happened to industry after industry after industry after industry. If you look at steel, nobody will ever use surplus. The steel industry didn't get taken over by Japan, it didn't get taken over by Korea, it didn't get taken over by China, it got taken over by Newport right in their backyards, right? US, US Steel got killed by Newport, it was right down the road. They made it cheaper, faster, better using recycling. So you don't want to be a commodity, but if you have product and a meaning, then you have a brand. And that's a good place to be. Meaning is the important piece. Also, it's important to know that just in old times, we thought we told the story and customers would listen and just accept it for what it is. But that's not the way it is anymore because consumers have access to just as much, if not more information than we do. There's reviews online. There's products, there are different products and competitors. I mean, you can pull up anything that side by side compare but almost faster than some of us can in our, inside our own businesses. So we are now curators of that story. We don't get to control it. The customer controls the story. 
we can only curate it. And like museum curators, it's our job to protect it, but also to harness it and go with it. We can't say, hey, this is where this story is going. We just have to go with where it goes. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. So positioning is how we lead to a brand. As I said, you can't market until you have a brand, you can't brand until you have positioning. And what is positioning? Best example is fast food. I show you these examples, everybody's probably pretty aware of where they fall in the marketplace, right? They all have different options, they're at different prices, they do different things, and they mean different things. That's positioning. In fact, Subway became the largest fast food chain by telling people where the healthy McDonald's. That's trend, positioning. They said, we're like McDonald's, only healthy. Then McDonald's got healthier. Now Subway's struggling. Then Chipotle took it to the next level. Cars, same way. If I show you these examples, you're probably in your mind knowing where they slot, right? From high end to middle to lower end, price wise, quality wise, whatever it may be, they built their story around it. But they can't build their story in space. They can't just say, hey, we're here. They have to say, we're like that, only different. So Toyota, quality. Mercedes Benz, right? Expensive. They're still cars, it's all the same parts at the end of the day. It's positioning, that's the difference. And the way they've done that is through triangulation. So if you're familiar with GPS, you need three, three dots, right? You need three dots. You need to know three locations and you can identify yours. So if you get two and you know your own, you're set. You can identify exactly where you're at. Positioning is the same way. Just as these guys did that, Mercedes said, we're here because Toyota's here and Chevy and everybody else is here. So if we know that, we can build our brand. So where that applies to farming, especially we took a look in dairy branding. And in dairy branding, everything's private label, which is interesting. 60% of the market for milk is private label. That's a good thing. That's an exciting thing. There's no Microsoft, right? If you were software, I get this all the time. In the Shipley Center, we help new companies. We help companies launch, we help people create companies. And they come and they say, I want to create a software. Well, sorry, it's over. Microsoft won. But they, they say, hey, I have this great new search algorithm. Nope, you don't. Google owns 82% of the world. Search algorithm. You, I don't care how much better it is, you've lost. You can't beat them, they won. Or I have a new auction site. Nope, that's eBay. Or I have a new social media platform. Nope, that's Facebook. So a lot of these places have won because they're big name companies and they've won the market. But in dairy and in most farming and in most products, nobody owns the market. And that's an exciting thing. It should be an exciting thing, unless you're one of the big guys, in which case it terrifies them. So here's how that breaks down. Fresh eggs is the biggest part of private label, followed by butter and butter blends. And then you get some additional things, refrigerated cream, cottage cheese, and it works its way down. But See, these are big numbers. These are billions and billions of dollars, all in private label, which is interesting. You want to look at it from the types of brands. Private label, again, low-fat milk, biggest brand in dairy. Private label, not Kraft, not Heinz, not Coke, not Pepsi, private label. Probably one of the very, it's one of the only markets I've seen and I've studied where that's the case. Normally, the top three are name brands, household names, we know them. We hate or love them, but we know them for sure. In this case, it's not. That's exciting. With that though, advertising spending is going up. Now to put it in perspective, $1.13 billion was spent on advertising in 2016. And that sounds like a ton of money. But if you sit, think about how many people, 360 million rough and tough in the US, that are customers of dairy, that's nothing. GM probably spends 30 billion a year itself. Ford, about the same. Toyota, about the same. Those are companies spending that much money on advertising themselves. So it's increasing, but it's still a very small number compared to the overall. And here's how it kind of looks. This is what advertising has been, been happening. It's been growing steadily from half a million and on its way up to about 1.2. Again, all specific to dairy. The competitive landscape is getting tougher. Sales spent on advertising is steadily increasing to over 3%. Again, that's not a large number. It means it's getting tougher, so it's a trend we wanted to recognize. But in most industries, you're spending 10 to 25% of sales on advertising. That's what, that's what on average, 10 to 25% of sales is spent on advertising. So even at the 3%, it's still pretty low. So it's kind of the wild, wild west a little bit. Positioning means you have a unique place in the market. But in nature, holds a secret. At the end of the day, we have natural selection, right? Darwinism. If you're unique, you find your spot in nature, you survive, you thrive. If not, you die. Marketing, 
Branding, same thing as nature. But unique doesn't mean original. Thomas Edison was very famous for that. He said ideas have to be original only in their adaptation. So if you think about that, some of the best ideas aren't original. They're just applied in a new way, a completely new way. So that's, that's the key. Unique doesn't mean original. And then finally, you gotta iterate as necessary. Altoids, here's a good one. Started off as it was supposed to be indigestion, but people use them as breath fresheners. And they were successful going back to the 19th century because they said, oh, people don't wanna buy us to help their indigestion. They wanna buy us to freshen their breath. We'll go with it. And they did. That's why they're still around. Whereas Kodak died because people wanted digital and they didn't go that way. Altoid said, fine, go with it. And that's why they've been around so long. So it's important. In order to, to position anything, you have to write a positioning statement. That's where you start. And the positioning statement ultimately boils down to four main things. It's who you are, what you're offering, whom it's for, and why it's important. We went over that quickly because it's a lot easier to go this way. So anybody a fan of Pixar? Yes, Pixar. Pixar is on in my house 24 seven, I swear. What's interesting is that their first six movies, they brainstormed in 30 minutes over lunch because they followed this pitch. For some reason, this resonates with us as humans. We don't know why. It's, you say once upon a time, something happened every day, something, the same thing happened. And then one day, something different happened. Because of that, stuff happened. Because of that, stuff happened until finally, happy ever after. And if you could fill that in for your brand, for your product, you have a positioning statement. That's how you build the story. You don't have to overcomplicate it. It's keeping it simple, in fact, that leads to the most successful stories. And once you throw it out there, expect it to, to expand. One of my favorites is Facebook. So I work with a lady that was at Harvard when Zuckerberg created Facebook. And people like to tell the story he created in his dorm room, started from nothing, he did all this stuff. No, he was trying to get a date. He was a computer nerd that was trying to get a date. And it just worked out for him. He wasn't trying to create Facebook. He wasn't trying to become a billionaire. He was trying to get himself a date and it was the only way he knew how, so he created it. So the story is taken to the next level because Facebook's done a good job of that. So how does this all apply to dairy? I don't know if it makes sense to go into that. I'm happy to do all that if you'd like, specifically. But dairy doesn't just mean dairy. It can mean anything, really. It's any product at this point. So the numbers will be specific to dairy, but it's any product. Any physical product this applies to now. So if you look at supply, dairy, mostly in the north, south, California is the big one. So it's kind of interesting where it's segmented. Um, dairy herds are in decline. Again, not uncommon. If you apply this to manufacturing, it'd be the same exact curve. I can almost overlay hard manufacturing and dairy, and you'll see the same states and the same exact curve. Number of manufacturers going down, where they're located, same exact places. So it's going down. Income from dairy is, is, has increasing with volatility. So it's going up, but you can see on the right-hand side, it's volatile, up and down, up and down, up and down. And what's interesting is when we looked at it, it doesn't correlate with inflation at all. One of the very few industries I've ever seen that doesn't correlate with inflation. Volatility has nothing to do with inflation. You could be having, you can see it, inflation drops, doesn't impact. Inflation goes up, doesn't impact. It's almost the reverse. So that means that it's a good thing and that it means people want it. It's inflation proof a little bit. It's not like the Mercedes where, okay, inflation goes up and people are going to stop buying them. That's a good thing, but it's also intriguing. I don't, I can't put my finger on why, it was just something that uh, was very interesting. Household expenditures on dairy, most people spend about 66% on the actual dairy products and 33.86% roughly tough on fresh milk and cream. Customers use dairy, you can see 68% included in everything, 13% avoid it, maybe food allergy, maybe whatever, 17% say they don't think about it. Consumption is going down, but it's not going down off the cliff. It's going down slowly. You can see it's, it's kind of petered out, went to 605, 607, 605, 606. So it's slightly up and slightly down uh, going through 2019. If you look at the dairy wholesaling market, it's mostly focused around retailers, they're the largest, other wholesalers, and food manufacturing processors that make up the biggest part of where dairy gets sold. Skim and low-fat milk make up 55% of the entire market. So that's interesting. Uh, whole milk maintains about 25.8%. Milk consumption going out to 2025 is expected to drop off to about, or about 0.44% per year. So we're gonna drink less and less and less. Don't know why, but we are. 
And it's not huge, again, it's not going off a cliff, but it is going down. So it's something to, to look at. So what are all those charts and data mean? Any market in decline has challenges. And those challenges include commoditization, competition, low profit margins, and potentially high barriers to entry by large players. So positioning, branding, again, it's the differentiator. It's how you break yourself out. It's how you compete against these things. Customer concern for dairy is key. But it's not just for dairy, it's for any product. If you think of food, people want to know where does our food come from. Go back to Chipotle. That's their main thing, right? They write on a board, the chickens came from here today. People believe them. Ask me who wants to go up and ask the person, like, is that for real? Like, do you guys just have a list that you write up? I don't know. Nobody's ever double checked it, right? But they do it. And that's their brand promise. And people want food security. We want food security. We want American made clothing. We're starting to see a big push for that. We want quality paper, we want quality ink, we want all these things. So it's important to understand that yes, it speaks to dairy, but it can apply to everything else. Story is important. Customer concern is the key. And why is it the key? Because we have six living generations. First time in history, we have six living generations. All of them are consumers. We have the GI generation, some call them the greatest generation. We have all the way through Generation Z or the boom ones, which may be the biggest generation we've ever had. They may exceed the baby boomers. We don't know yet, which is kind of interesting. So each of them has their own wants. Each of them has their own loyalties, dislikes, and ways that they want to be communicated with and products and expectations. So if you go right to the top, GI generation, the children of World War I, they went through the Great Depression. Price is important. Loyalty is important. Savings is important. And this is what marketing industry was built around was this generation. Unfortunately, there's not as many of them as there once were. And every year they're declining. So they're still a relevant industry or, or segment, I should say, but they're not as big, but it's important to understand that. The mature silence, again, another, another demographic that's, that's shrinking, but they have some different things. They're avid readers, they like newspapers, they're disciplined, self-sacrificing self and cautious. Whereas their parents are a little bit more out there, they're a little bit, more reserved, which tends to happen generation after generation. Again, that impacts how they buy, that impacts where they look for products, that impacts what they expect in terms of the story. Then the baby boomers, everybody's aware of them, the largest, they're, they're called the me generation. They'll buy anything and use credit to do it. They want it now. Um, they're the largest generation in history with about 77 million people, but even then they've started to see them. That's why they say boomers may exceed them very, very shortly. And the greatest example of that is the fact that um, if you look at like minivans, right? So we just bought a minivan. Well, I say we, my wife and I didn't buy the minivan, my kids did, right? We pay the bills for sure, but my kids are the consumers that bought it. They had to have this one because it has a video game system and it has this seats and this seat does this and we can put this here and this here. Car companies don't put those in for me. I don't even know how to use three quarters of the stuff when we've had it for a year. I don't even know what half the buttons are, but the kids do because they've recognized, okay, we're gonna go after them. My kids all follow that last generation. And why they don't care about me is because I'm generation X and we're small generation and they figure we've already gotten our loyalties and whatnot. They're going after the 10 and 14 year old because if you get them, cost of customer acquisition, pay that price, you get a longer lifetime value. So generation X, that's me, they're the latchkey kids. We tend to basically hate the world and distrust the world in any way, shape or form. Um, because we are constantly being compared to, generate, to the baby boomers, and so we have a chip on our shoulder. And it's kind of an interesting thing, but again, we kind of don't get, uh, don't get studied as much because we're not as big. Generation Y millennials, they've gotten a ton of, a ton of studies because they're the first generation that, to be alive that never knew the world without internet, never knew the world without computers, and that's led to some interesting insights. They just expect things. But even there, they're kind of getting boring because of this new one, which is boom ones. They're the tweens. And on average, these people control about $170 billion. That's what their parents spend on them. That's a lot of money. And I knew we were in trouble the day my sing we got a new TV and my six-year-olds walked up to it and they put their fingers on it and went like this. They said, Dad, it's broken. I said, nope, here's a controller. This is how you turn the thing on. Well, that's, we need a different one because that's what they expect. They've never known the world without a smartphone. They've never known the world without things interacting. When they do homework now, they ask Alexa to check it. They say, Alexa, what's 20 times 20? Here's what it is. 
they interact with, in, with technology like it's a piece of themselves. It's not a toy, it's not something they need to learn, it just integrates. And that's why we're spending a ton of time studying them. But what's interesting about them is they want better. That's all they care about. And if you have children that age group, we just finished, we just were able to experience one of the best examples of that. At Christmas time, they get gifts, they will drop whatever it was before them. If it was their favorite toy, they don't care. They will drop it if they got something better at Christmas time. They will literally throw it out. They pick it up, oh, this one's better, okay. There is no loyalty. They are in constant search of better. And they don't care about brand names, they don't care about history or stories, they want better. Prove to me it's better and we will adopt it. And if somebody else comes out with something better tomorrow, we'll adopt it. The average app right now, the, life the entire lifespan of an app is 100,000 downloads in three months. It's the entire lifespan. If something better comes out and they drop it, they don't care. So because of these six generations, bring some interesting marketing, marketing focuses that we need to do. So the, what, we, what we distilled for the areas of focus for dairy are twofold, customer concern and distribution channels. And again, this can apply to any product. Customer concern is all about telling your story, telling a story that they resonate with. So the Chipotle saying, here's where the chicken came from. It's the, the, the organic milk. It's, it's all sorts of things. And distribution channels is understanding how people want to shop. What's interesting, so customer concern, how we know this, what does it mean in terms of dairy? Dairy means humanely raised. Now when you ask them what is humanely raised, people say it's better treatment of animals, but number two is the interesting thing, safer food. They say raising things humanely, raising animals humanely leads to safer food. That's important, it goes back to food safety. So it's not they don't want to save animals necessarily, they want safer food. Yeah, a lot of people say it's nicer to raise them humanely, they want safer food, that's their customer concern. If you tell a story about that, that'll resonate with people. They also want health. If you look at the last, the, the Google searches, every Google search except Kefir is up oh, significantly year over year. If you look at health food stores near me, the average number of searches are 287% up year over year. So people want healthy food. So they want safe food, they want healthy food. Very important. What's the impact of this? Seals or certifications earned or created should, present, should represent one of the their main areas. People trust seals, they trust certifications, they don't trust stories, they don't trust commercials, they don't trust marketing materials, but they trust seals, they trust certifications, they trust third party recommendations. That's one of Amazon's most brilliant things is the referrals, it's the number of stars, right? They stole it from eBay at the end of the day, it's, oh, this product, and again, I, I go back, I keep going back to my kids, but I see that. Whereas me, I look at it, I want to know what's the spec sheet when I'm making the purchase, I want to understand is it worth the price, it's worth this. My kids go, it's got four stars, it's great. I don't even think about it. Oh, four stars. You gotta trust it. They want sales and certification. Uh, so a great example, and we have this at Clarkson, right? So at Clarkson, you'll see on every other building, we'll say lead certified platinum, or lead certified gold, right? And then you ask a student and they'll say, that's great. We expect lead certification. And then you take it a step further, you say, what is it? I don't know. Then I take it a step further, I'll say, how do you spell it? Oh, L-E-A-D, no, L-E-E-D. They don't care. It's a name brand that they've heard. It's something that they heard is good, they equate it with good, therefore they demand it. So organic has become that. Where if you push someone and say, what is organic, they can't tell you. Or GMO verified, or locally raised, right? They don't take the next step very often, especially with the younger generation, but they wanna make sure that the label's there. And it's gotta be a third party. You can't say, so a good example is Price Chopper with the meat, right? You can't put hamburger, Price Chopper can't put hamburger out and say organic. They have to have the organic seal because people don't trust that Price Chopper isn't just putting on there. And so, yeah, that's what we mean by seals and certifications. You see it a lot with cleaning supplies now, with clothes, almost everything has its own seal and certification that they can throw on it. That's this third party verifier, supposedly, that says it's good. I think certifications will go away and here's why. So we have a company called Agbot. And Agbotic has a greenhouse the size of an or it's the size of a football field under glass, which isn't interesting, right? Because there's tons of multiple clubs. What's interesting about Agbotic is that it's robotic in that the robot plants the seed, the robot cultivates, the robot waters, the robot harvests. So because of that, from the minute it's put in the, the second it's put in the ground to the food being packaging, the robot videotapes that food product. 
So that's the next evolution. So now you want to know, okay, food safety, where are my beet greens? We can, you can pull up your phone and literally watch the plant be planted, harvest it, grow, harvest it, and ship to you. Correct. Yep. I think you'll, you'll see that because, especially as these seals and certifications start getting under, um, they, they're, they're being examined. Some of them are very good. Some of them have fallen flat. Some of them have had some other things. People are starting to lose credit in them. And I think you're right. You'll see that they are becoming white place, right? I mean, it, we say that with organic, or agbotics is a good example where we said, you know, can we get certified organic? And the people said, no, like, you don't understand. This is an indoor, completely closed, non-GMO. Like we control this environment 100%. It's the next evolution of it. And so I think you'll see a lot of that go away as information becomes more available. And not just in food, but in everything, right? If you think right now, it, some of the high-end cars, you can literally watch, get a video of, okay, you know, this car was created and here's the people that worked on it and here's the parts of where they came from. You get the whole supply chain, that's happening. We're seeing a tremendous industry growth. Um, and as I look around the room, in recovered wood, where people are barcoding the recovered wood and they can say this wood came from this barn on this date and now I'm using it in my staircase. So I think because they're cutting out the milk. It's a great question. The other piece is choosing a channel. So again, as I said, people are going online. So 60% of people did not purchase any specialty food items online last year. 11% of people purchased cheese. 8% of people purchased yogurt. 6% purchased ice cream online. And that's only gonna go up because it's too easy. Again, go back to my example with my children for dish detergent. In their minds, why do we have to get in the car, drive, drive to Price Shopper, get out, it's cold, wait in line, find the right thing and get back when I can say, Alexa, order it for me and it shows up on my doorstep the next day. Amazon. Are you familiar with a Kraft bottle, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Heinz ketchup bottle? Right, so on the Heinz ketchup bottle, it says 57. Anybody know what the 57 means? So Heinz used to be the number one pickle company in the world, and they had 57 different types of pickles. But in consumers' minds, you cannot be the leading brand of two things at once. We will never allow it. So they had to make a conscious choice to say, okay, we think ketchup is going to be bigger than pickles, and they became number one in our minds in ketchup. Now, they maintain the 57 as an homage to where they started from, but they don't even sell pickles anymore. Other companies have taken over the top there because we can't say you can't be the best in pickles and the best in, in, in their, uh, ketchup as well. And that's why Walmart has been cheap, 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 cheap. Right. And now Amazon has it. Amazon started as a bookstore. Is there anything we trust more than books? That's why I say they're going to win because if I'm right. GE, if I'm Whirlpool, I want to work with Amazon. I don't want to work with them. Because again, going back to what you talked about, Walmart has beaten them up for too many years. Walmart has beaten oh, up the GEs. They've beaten up every, everybody they need to partner with now. They've kicked the crap out of for the last 20, 30, 40 years to get as low profit margins, whatever. It's kind of they're going to lie in the bed that made them now. Now when they, they go back to them and say, hey, we kind of need your help to stay afloat, people are going to say, yeah, we're going to go with them. So that's why I say they're going to win. But we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. Some traditional channels. For dairy, what's interesting, um, grocery stores have experienced 4% decline in milk. Milk sales. Well, drug stores are up 4.8%. So convenience exceeds planning at this point. What this means, we have a lack of planning. We don't have a lot of time. So even milk now, a commodity, a necessity, in most houses, is something that we buy at the last minute, spur of the moment. Oh, yep, I need to pick this up. I'm going to buy that too. Not necessarily on the grocery store list. And these can impact the marketing because, okay, whereas traditionally we had to compete in the grocery store with all these other products, nope, now we're competing against. People Magazine and Mountain Dew. We won't even thought about that as a dairy people. That's what we're competing against, it's spot buys. Other thing to keep in mind, where we live right now from a dairy perspective or any product, we're really uniquely positioned. We are in position to have tons of major markets. You can see that they're all in 400 miles. You can see the average price or the average uh, miles per hour you can travel because of the highways to get there. You can see the average minutes it takes to get to these places and the total population. We have six metropolitan markets in the top 100 in the U.S. in 400 miles, and seven of them in the top 100 in Canada, and 49 million people in 400 miles. 49 million people. So when I go back from a dairy perspective and I show where everybody, you know, I, I show the chart of where everything's made, California doesn't have that. 
Texas doesn't have that. They don't have 49 million people with a foreign currency license. They don't have New York, they don't have Boston, they don't have Philly, they don't have Toronto, they don't have Ottawa, they don't have Montreal. Uh, Quebec City, we do. We're uniquely positioned, whether it's dairy, whether it's any product. Now, whether we take advantage of that, I think there's an opportunity that we have historically, but it's something that we say, oh, we're in the North country. We're actually smack dab in the middle of one of the largest population concentrations in North America. Yeah, the border gets in the way, and especially for dairy, I get that we can't cross border and there's some border questions going on right now. But going back to Amazon, going back to digital, digital doesn't care about borders. They can care less, right? Digital crosses. So it's something to keep in mind. So consumption of those 49 million in, per in percentage of dairy estimates about 1.7 billion pounds of dairy, 2018, 2019. So even though it's going down, it's still a significant amount that we can serve. Is that right? So in summary, bring it all together. Branding can differentiate. We need to do it because we're overwhelmed. Six generations of customers alive today, we need to identify. You can't just say we're selling to 50 year old women. No, not anymore. We gotta say which generation, what story are we telling and why? Customer concern's a major story. It doesn't matter what you're selling, customers wanna know. There's no reason they can't know now. They wanna know the backstory. Unless you got a 25, 30 year relationship with them where you have that trust built up, they're gonna wanna know and you gotta provide that. And picking the right channels can help. And no matter what business you're in, those channels are more increasingly becoming. Everybody expects everything to be on. So that's what I got. Questions? <laughs>